So today's lesson is titled, Changing the World One Person at a Time. And uh, this is an interesting world that we live in, isn't it? We've seen some things lately, a lot in the news. I know, um, you know, when you turn on the news or when you check your email and you see it on the page or whatever it is on social media, you know, the stock market's down, inflation's high, there's military conflicts all around the world, we've got hot button moral and political issues making the headlines daily, even yesterday, which I saw this morning, um, I guess a man walks into a grocery store at 2.30 in the afternoon, opens fire and kills 10 people in New York, and uh, said he was radicalized online during COVID, during the lockdown in 2020. He said he was bored and he was just perusing the internet and found some, uh, somebody that told him what he needed to do with his life. And then he, he did it. And of course, the button of the day today and even last week is the, um, the uh, Supreme Court issue on abortion. Now, <clears throat> I want to remind us some things in church today. Uh, that's my goal in this service is to remind us of some things that are in the Bible. And that's why we have so many scriptures we're going to be reading. But it probably comes to no surprise to anybody that we're not known for being a pro-abortion place. Uh, I would say probably most Christian churches have that reputation. Um, we also like babies. We believe God created them and had them in mind before their parents even did. That's okay, and that's a position that most uh, most of us hold. You've you've told me that. I hold that position as a just as a person in this world, and I'm okay to share that. Um, but this is something that has affected our country, and in more recent days and weeks, it has affected us maybe more than usual. Now, there's some, there's some stats out there that tell us that, you know, maybe about one out of every 25 women in America could, could have an abortion, right? Um, it's likely that we know three or four people, there could be three or four, 10, 12, even in this church, who have previously had an abortion. Such a very serious topic, and maybe not something you're used to hearing in church, especially from me. But this is what I want to remind us of today. First off, we got to get a grip on what God says to people, just to people in general, okay? When you get saved and born again, you become a child of God. I think we can agree on that. You know, I want to hit today some points that believers can agree on and hopefully leave here in some kind of unity. The same thing happened to me when I got born again. You say, well, you were just a little kid. Yeah, I know. Have you ever taught school and you see the kids that aren't born again? That, see, now you guys are getting my, I always throw a joke out there in the beginning. Now you're starting to, but look, I had a born again experience. Everybody did. And when I come to worship God, he sees me as a child of God, just like he sees all of you who come to worship the Lord today. The Bible says, 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So I want to pray over this word today before we get started. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be a child of God. Lord, in the midst of my sin, you still gave me the opportunity. And you still called me out of sin, out of a life of sin, out of my bad decisions, out of darkness, into your kingdom. And I pray today you would do that for anybody who needs that done. And that you would reassure us, Lord, of this salvation that we have inside of us, the Spirit of God living in us. And Lord, sustain us in these tough times. In Jesus' name, amen. The one thing you can't do, and I, I just want you to understand this. If you are somebody that fit into that category of decision in times past, or if you know somebody or you have somebody close to you that has made this decision, <clears throat> You can't relive the past and make different decisions. You know that? But your future isn't written yet, 
And today I want to remind us of what our future looks like with God. Looking ahead, this is how God sees all of us. Now, the reason why I'm addressing this in this manner today is just because of the timing of events, right? Um, it seems like everywhere I go, I mean, we did get some communication from our, from our Assemblies of God district in Sacramento and kind of letting us know what's happening in the, in the world today at different levels. And, you know, they encouraged us to do a few things. And, uh, and those things have been done, you know, to just make an awareness of, of what's happening in the world. As I began to pray about that, and, you know, for those of you who know me, you know that I'm, <clears throat> I'm not exactly Mr. Political from the pulpit. Um, now, this isn't just a political issue. It's also a moral issue, and I understand the, the sensitivity thereof. But when I began to pray about how to even approach this, uh, I felt like I should approach it from the standpoint of what God's promises are to people on earth today, okay? And that includes, and I know this, is, this maybe doesn't fit what you might hear on the news, on conservative radio or the news, but that includes people who have gotten an abortion in their lives. It includes them. It also includes um, people who have lied and stolen things. It also includes people who've been violent criminals. It also includes the sexually immoral at one time in their life. It also includes the prideful and the ungodly and the unbelieving at one time in their life. And that is our premise for these scriptures. So you gotta just hang on with me today because what I'm, what I'm not gonna do is I'm not going to get on the bandwagon today of taking pulpit time away from the Word of God. I can't do it, all right? It's not my calling. So there's a place for that. <clears throat> of course, we can all vote. We can all demonstrate, and I don't, I don't have a problem with any of that. We can hold signs. We can do whatever we think we need to do as citizens of this country to make our voices heard. But when we come to church, we really need to know what God says. Because we've got a thousand and more voices telling us what everyone else thinks about life. And some things are good, and some things are bad, and people have different opinions. But when we come to church, we really just need to know what God says. That's what makes this place special. And that's what makes the body of Christ special to me. Let's start with these three scriptures here. We're talking about our future in God. Regardless of your standpoint on social, political, moral issues, regardless of your past history of sin and the ability that you've had to commit sins of all kinds, this is what God says about our potential future. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that not the whole reason we're even here? I mean... Six months ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, uh, go back 50 years ago. The issues are always different. But isn't that why we're here today in church? Because while we were still sinners, Christ obliterated us from the earth because we were all hopeless and a disaster. No, he died for us. And that's what makes this place special. Psalm 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west... So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. And then the last scripture here, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What I want to be careful about this morning and hope that we're all a little careful about is to recognize when issues arise in society, in life, even in the church or in our families, personal lives, wherever, that we are careful to value people 
the way that God values people. You know, the issues are often right and wrong, and that's not surprising. There is legitimate evil that's obvious, and we're not even speaking about changing that. But what we want to know today and what we want to walk out here with today is the attitude toward other human beings that God has. We already know what the right thinks about the left. You don't need your pastor to tell you that. You know what I mean? We already know what the left thinks about the right. You don't need my help on that one either. But what I want you to know is what God thinks about people. And that's what we're doing here today. In Revelation 5, 9, it says, you know, we're getting to the end here of the Bible. And he says, "For he, uh, speaking of Jesus, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Nobody is excluded, not even people from California. We get to be saved, residents of the most immoral state in the union, right? I mean, isn't that what we love to harp on? Isn't that what we share on, on social media and all these catchy things about how bad California is and how awesome Idaho is all the time? By the way, I'm not interested. You can have all that snow. You can have all those chains and salting your roads. Go for it, rusting out the wheel wells on your vehicles. I like California, but I also know we don't exactly have the best reputation. In the midst of this place, though, God rescues people from sin. You know that? I mean, I'm glad I get some amen. That's right, Kay. And you know, the only way he rescues, uh, the only way it's visible to others is when he rescues us from our bad decisions. I mean, really, you pick any issue you want. I mean, we're speaking of a sensitive issue this morning, but you pick any issue you want that's a real issue that people get really angry about. Somebody's got to make a bad decision for that to be visible. And when God comes into their life, like he did ours, we make better decisions, and that is also visible. It's the testimony of what God has done in our life. It's the changed life. Pastor preached, I believe it was last week or the week before, on being severed from the world. Well, what is it? How would you even know if somebody is severed from the world? Because their decisions change, right? The things that they do change. It becomes visible to people. You say, wow, that guy has been cut out from his old life. He's not the way he was anymore. What happens when we, when we see things that are away from us? You know, I was telling Brian this morning, I preached a sermon maybe six, eight months ago entitled Pastors or Podcasts. Does anybody remember that one? Two of you, great. So... It's, it's interesting how I could probably just regurgitate that this morning, and it would be just as valid again. Because here we are again, round two, right? And I'll tell you why, but what we like to do as people is we like to have a poster child for our opinion. So what we do is we go on TV, internet, phone, etc., and we find the loudest voice who's speaking the loudest thing that we disagree with. And we make them the devil. And we vilify that person and our hatred stirs toward that person. I'm speaking to you as a human being here. Don't act like you don't do it. And we begin to just curse them in our mind and we wish them evil, don't we? Because our flesh hates what they're saying and they're the poster child for our disagreement with them. But then when I open my Bible and I say, God, it says that while, while I was a sinner, you died for me, but I know you didn't die for them. As far as the east is from the west, God, I know you removed my transgressions from me, but you could never do it for them. Don't you see what they're doing? But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God rescues people from their sin. And when you read the entirety of the Bible and you see the stories and the encounters that God has had with mankind, he rescues people out of disastrous sin. And what I want us to understand today and be reminded of is that God is still in the business of rescuing people from their sin. 
even the sins that we would say are disastrous and have disastrous consequences. Yet God is still in the business of rescuing people. Even from California, right? And as much as it is important to hold and uphold a high moral standard in society, and it is, and understand that when I speak to you about the Word of God, I am in no way, in no way trying to dilute the importance of these other issues in their place, and no way trying to convince you of something one way or the other, but we are strictly saying, what does God think about people today? But as much as it, it is important to hold up high moral standards in society, it is even more important to believe that Jesus Christ can rescue us from our sin. How tragic would it be to rescue an unborn baby from extermination only to watch it grow up before your eyes on a trajectory to hell? What is the greater need and what is the greater issue in the world that we live in today? Could it possibly grow up that way because there aren't enough Christians willing to share the good news of Jesus with sinners in the world? You know, sometimes we act like the day of judgment is today, don't we? You know, you, you, get, on, you get online, you, you watch the news, you watch your program, you listen to the podcast. It's the day of judgment every day you wake up, isn't it? I mean, people just slamming everybody all the time. I tried to catch the scores the other day, and I keep doing this to myself just because I've enjoyed sports my whole life, and I keep doing it over and over. I just, I'm on my way somewhere, and I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch the scores of the game, you know? Turn on the AM station that used to just talk about sports, and it's like five minutes in, this guy just rails on somebody. That's all he does. He just down talks this other um, person in the world that he's never met, that I've never met, that I don't even, I'll never meet, I don't know anything about him. And I'm sitting here just waiting for him to tell me the score of the game. Finally, I just shut it off. I'm like, why did I do that again? I mean, how many times do I have to get burned with today's media before I realize they're going to talk about the thing that will make me listen? They're not there to give me information anymore. They're not there to give me the scores to the sports game anymore. They're there to talk about the thing that will catch my attention and allow me to listen to them without turning their radio station off. Today is actually not the day of judgment. We got to be reminded of this because this is how people live in the world today. We live on the precipice, on the edge of judgment against all people that we ever see, meet, or know. We can meet people for five seconds and we're already, you know, basically deciding their salvation, their eternal destiny. But all we need to do is be reminded of what day it was for us, the day that Christ came into our life. You know, the Bible says judgment day is actually, it's at, it's at the end of the Bible. I mean, we just talked about it in our Revelation class. It's in Revelation chapter 20. There is a day of judgment. Guess who the judge is? It's not any of us. It's God. And this day of judgment is at a time when no other decisions can be made. There's no going back on the real day of judgment. The earth is gone. I was telling Brian this morning, read the end. God has already dissolved the earth. And we stand in the presence of God somehow where there's no matter you know, like scientific matter, that's gone, but somehow we're, we're before God. It's unexplainable. But there's a day of judgment, a day of accountability, and it's a serious day. But that day is way out there, way after the rapture of the church even. There's so much time now to tell people about who Jesus is and what he's done, to have a great effect on the destiny of the souls of mankind. We have so much time now because when this age is over, there is zero time, none. Now, I don't need to tell you we have 100 years left or we have 50 or 10 or 1,000 years or God's going to come back tomorrow. But if we're living and breathing today, that's what time it is today. Not the day of judgment, but the day of salvation. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. What if the church got behind this kind of a message? Now, I'm a little bit passionate about this. You can say it's because now I'm a pastor, and so I all of a sudden care more about this stuff. But if you've been around me for a while, you know that this has been me for quite a while. But what if the church got behind this message? That instead of today being the day of judgment, that it's the day of salvation. What would change and who would be changed? You know, I have made, not a lot, because my wife doesn't let me get out there too far. But I have made a few enemies in my lifetime with my opinions and my judgment on this, that, or the other, or somebody. Has anybody ever made a judgment call that irritated somebody? Yeah, I think it does happen. And you know that not one person in that experience, none of my enemies got saved through my encounter with them. None of them, I mean, is that hard to believe? Not one of them repented of their sins and committed their life to Jesus because I shared a controversial opinion with them to the point of conflict and stubbornness on my end. What would change if we got behind God's plan of salvation for sinners? See, I know what would change because it happened to me. Why is salvation not good enough for other people? It's just only good enough for me and for you guys. But God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins because of our sin, not because of our righteousness. He became righteousness for me when I couldn't do it. That changed my life. It didn't just change my philosophical life. It changed my decisions. It changed my behavior and it changed my reputation. It also changed my future. Have you noticed, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just throw this stuff out there real quick, okay? And then we'll get to some more scriptures. Have you noticed though the grip that society has in the world today, our global society, just whatever, everybody's connected now. Have you noticed the grip that they have on our, our thinking, our decisions? Now, you think I'm going somewhere, but I'm not. Some of you know that I always do this to you. So you know I'm going to pull the rug out from under you. I'm just warning you. Have you noticed the flow of information, the highs and the lows that are so predictable? Have you noticed these over the last few years? You know, the ability to get information to people has changed the way we are influenced by things in the world. All of us are affected. Can you think back on it pre-COVID? First, it was the presidential election. The ups and the downs, the judgment, the hate. Look, I voted. I picked one person and I voted for him. I didn't vote for everybody. Some people I didn't vote for. One person I voted for. You gotta make a decision, but boy, we were flooded, inundated with information about people we've never met from people we've never met or don't know at all. It changed us, it affected us, it applied stress to our life. And then we took a breath and then COVID hit. Now I'm not downplaying any of these issues, but let me just give you a quick little time lapse here. First it was the election, then it was COVID, then it was George Floyd. Do you remember the turmoil in our country? We're not making light of these issues, but do you remember that cities were on fire over these issues? Things that were happening that we never thought would happen or had no reason to happen by people who weren't connected to anything. Then it was George Floyd, then it was COVID again, then it was our retreat from Afghanistan, then it was Omicron, which I was a part of, then it was Ukraine, and I don't want to go back to Omicron, by the way. Then it was Ukraine, and I don't mean to make light of any of these issues, but now the spotlight is on abortion. All of these are serious issues. All of these affect human life. All of these are tragic, okay? 
we, we support a woman's friend, Pregnancy Resource Center. We believe in the cause, okay? So when we're talking about this stuff, we're, please don't leave out of here and say, oh, Pastor John said that abortion is not a big issue. You know, new life is in favor of it. You know, I, I can only see the headlines now, you know. No, we, we, we support. We put our money into places that we say are valuable, all right? We're going to support. We're going to serve. And we believe in the sanctity of life. Okay, let's just get that right out of the way here. But I'm going to get to some information right after I tell you something you don't want to hear. And that's really what I want to tell you this morning, okay? So just bear with me. The last few years we've seen, it's like we thought this was going to be the issue that divides America. And then it passes away within two months, and people forgot all about it. And then there's another issue. This is going to do it. This is going to destroy America. I just listed about seven or eight of those, and then after two months, everybody forgot about it. Has anybody even remembered our retreat from Afghanistan right now? No. You know why? Because it's not in the news. The history teacher did. That's it. Nobody's talking about it, right? Because we thought, oh, no, the Taliban are taking over the whole world. They're going to nuke us. It's over. Everything's doom and gloom. And then all of a sudden, Russia's like, oh, there's a country we'll invade. Now that got the news, and now we're on to this next thing that's going to divide the country again. And all of these things, it's like this is going to be the end of the world, the end of the country, the end of all things. Are you aware, and I'm just throwing out some stats, and I can, I'll show you where I got them. I got the listing right here. But are you aware that abortions have been declining in America since 1990? I was actually surprised, by the way. I got to be honest. When I was doing a little research, just figuring out, why is this coming around now, right? I was shocked. The total number, right? Where, where where's everybody been for the last 30 years? Why now? Why today? Why is this the issue of today when it's been steadily declining to the point that half as many, the number has been cut in half with no panic from Christian leaders, conservatives, just general voting and general keeping it in the news, but I haven't seen a, a country divided over this issue in the last 30 years. And yet, the total number has been cut in half. Something's weird about that. Where, has, where have all the podcasts been? Where's Tucker Carlson been? Where's he been for 30 years? Where have the pastors been, the Republicans? But they're all on board now. Where were you when we were committing twice as many abortions in this country when I was 10 years old? Where were you all of my time in high school when they're talking about... Uh, passing all this stuff out and making, letting kids get them without telling their parents and all this stuff. Where was everybody? And now that it's been cut in half, the whole world's falling apart. Okay. Something just doesn't make sense there. Did you know that for the past five years straight, we've had the lowest number of abortions in America since 1974, which was one year after Roe versus Wade? I mean, this is weird information you're hearing because it doesn't match the uproar, it doesn't match where we're at in society today. And in no way are we downgrading the importance of eliminating this law off the books, okay? So let's just say that. At half, we're still almost a million people a year, which is crazy, right? But we have lower number of abortions in America, even though we have over 113 million more people in the country. And the total number is still less than that. Now, here's what I wanted to tell you, because we're in church. You can go online and you can research your own information from all the reputable sources and get these numbers yourself. You can develop a political opinion on this stuff. You can be an activist, and I will applaud you for it. I will pay you to do it. If you ask me for money, I will donate to your cause, okay? But we're in church, and this, see, that's just to tell you where the world is right now, and now I want to tell you where the church is right now. All right? So follow me. Meanwhile, so in the last 40 years, 50 years, whatever it's been, meanwhile, the increase in the number of churches is about one-eighth of what is needed to keep up with population growth in this country. One-eighth. That's 
how fast the deterioration of Christian influence in our society is taking place. We are not keeping up with people being born in this country even after so many of those pregnancies are terminated. But nobody's reporting that because having enough churches to meet the demand of sinners is not a high priority to the world. And do you know that it's also not a high priority to Christians? That is alarming. The title of this message was Changing the World One Person at a Time. If the present trends continue, the percentage of the population that even attends church in 2050 will be almost half of what it is today. Meanwhile, the population will probably have doubled. We are in an emergency decline in the Christian world in America today. And we've got to get a grip on that because there is something at stake that is more valuable than anything that could happen here. And that's hard to think about when we read about these issues affecting the world today. COVID, the stock market, Ukraine, abortion, Afghanistan, civil rights. Those are huge, hugely important issues. But none of them are as important as the eternal destiny of a soul. In my lifetime, the largest people group has been the baby boomer generation, the largest cohort in our country. But they are quickly being surpassed by what are called the millennials, also of which I am not a part of. <laughs> and what we're finding is there's some stats out there of these two gigantic people groups. And we're all included in this anyway. But you know that the millennials are younger than me, by the way, if you didn't know. Starts like the year after me. 59% of millennials who were born with a religious affiliation tend to unplug from their church. These are just some church stats that I got off of a research website. 35% of millennials think that the church does more harm than good. See, this is our reputation for the next generation. Since 1991, so you're not off the hook either, church attendance among baby boomers has declined to 38%. And this is the picture of the American home right here. 80% of the time, women decide whether a family attends church or not. Did you know you had that much responsibility? You ladies, did you know you had that much power? Now, I'm, I'm glad that you would make that decision, if that's anybody in here. I'm glad you would do that because that's a good thing to do. But I'm sad that the men of this country and families in America are not leading their homes in this direction. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that churches are in decline. I'm not surprised that church attendance is in decline across the, the nation. I'm not surprised that the born-again experience doesn't look like it used to. I'm not surprised that people aren't severed from the world when they commit their life to Christ and their definition of commitment is different than mine. I'm not surprised at that. When we look at the state of the families in America and we see the opinions that are driving daily life, thoughts, and decisions. It's inevitable. We, we didn't wake up to a mess when the Supreme Court decided to look over a controversial decision. We didn't wake up to a mess in America when Donald Trump ran for president or the day after when, when Joe Biden won the election or whatever you want to say and all that. We didn't wake up to a mess on that day. We've been living in this thing for generations. You know, I'm not a boomer either because boomers are much older than me. <laughs> but this mess is even older than you. 
So don't walk out of here with the blame on your shoulders, right? But we need to be realistic about the world that we live in. We're not of this world, hopefully, but we live here. And this place is full of some messes, and the church is not immune to these messes. The church at large, we've missed some things. And if we're going to do anything to affect anybody living in this world, we're going to have to do it one person at a time. Now, does it worry you that the world is getting so bad? Be reminded, last set of scriptures as we get to close here. God is still in the business of saving sinners. It's almost a perfect storm here. We get to live where the odds are great. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, going to the school dance and you show up and there's only like four guys there and there's 20, you know, 25 girls. Like, yeah, you got pretty good odds of being able to dance with somebody, right? I mean, I don't know. I, I did go to a dance in junior high. I don't know. But God's in the business of saving sinners. Look around our country. The church is in decline. All of these moral issues are falling apart. Uh, everything goes against what the Bible says. There's no respect at all for God, no acknowledgement of him at all. We could not ask for a better time to be alive as a believer because it's wide open now. I mean, you thought you had to be some professional like preacher or some great evangelist to do something for God in times past. Well, I'm not Billy Graham or I'm not Oral Roberts or whoever the, the publicized names were. It doesn't even matter now. Just go pick somebody. Oh, well, I don't, I don't want to tell somebody about the Lord or what he's done for me. What if they, what if they already are saved and that's going to be funny? Trust me, they're not. Just go tell them anyway. Well, what if people don't like me if I do that? Well, let me ask you, do you want what they have? You know, when people talk to me about family and child raising, I just reaffirm this to my family all the time. Do you want what they have? Do you want what they have? Because you know what? I know what I have. And I don't have anything that God didn't give me. I don't have anything that I created without submitting my life to the things of God. But everything that I have submitted my life to in the things of God has produced good fruit. And when I do it my way, it ain't so good. So I know what I have. And I just tell my family, look, we have peace in our home. We have peace in our home. We love God. We don't live in condemnation every day. Your mom and dad don't scream and yell and throw you across the room. We don't sit there and cuss you out and talk on the phone to people one way and then turn around and put the smile on as soon as we hang the phone up. We don't do that. We don't live that way. You know why? Because God did something in my life. He changed me and he's in the process of doing that. And every time I do things his way, it's good. God's in the business of saving sinners. Let's not give up on him just yet. Mark eleven twenty four 24 tells us how we should pray. And I'll close with a few scriptures here. And he says, uh, Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And then he says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I just wonder, and I might try this so that I can testify to this church. If I picked somebody to pray for, Maybe just, you tell me, who do you hate the most, right? Who's the, <laughs> who's the poster child that you just can't stand seeing their face every time you, you check your phone, right? Give me their name, and let's, I just, maybe I should try this. I'll try to pray for that person not to change their mind. I won't pray that they move from the left to the right or the right to the left. I won't pray that they vote a certain way. I won't pray that they think a certain way or that they stop talking a certain way. I will pray for their salvation. And when it happens, I will testify that God rescued a sinner from their sin. And we will celebrate that person, and I'll put their face up on the screen, and you can clap for them. What if we tried that, right? What if we knew somebody, even in, in real life, that we just thought, they are hopeless, Look at the agenda that they follow. They're hopeless. They're headed for hell. We know what the Bible says about them. 
they're damned, right? They're going to be judged on the day of judgment day. We're prophesying it right now. There's no hope for them. Well, you pick that person, and instead of using that rhetoric, what if you put them on your prayer list? Not that they would change their ways, not that they would start thinking like you, not that they would be a nicer person, not that they would do anything or even come to church, but pray for their salvation. And here's the thing. When it happens, you will know it. When they get saved, you will know them by their fruit. 1 John 3 says, and this is the commandment, verse 23, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us a commandment. Micah 7, 19, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. God can do this. Do you know that? He doesn't need to change society. We don't even need God to change society. You know what we need God to do? We need God to change us. And if he might answer my prayer, maybe he will change another person too. And then another person, and then another person. See, when you come over to my house, you know, I always tell the cousins this, because sometimes they hear things, and, and our kids as well, and and they hear the, the conversation around the campus, right, or wherever they are. And I, we're in my backyard, and I just tell them, I said, does it matter? Does it matter who the president is right now? Because we're sitting here in the comfort of our own home with peace and love and joy, and we're roasting marshmallows around a fire pit. Does anybody give a care who, who the president is or, or what's going on some other place or if you think it should happen this way or that or the economy or whatever? I'm in charge of the world that I live in. And that world is a world that was created by the fruit of the Lord in my life. It says, he will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we read 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The best thing that could ever happen to a person in America is that their life could be changed by a relationship with Jesus Christ. That will fix everything in their world. You know that? Are we always going to have evil? Yeah, we will. We see that. We read the book. We, we see the end of the story. We know that there is good and evil, and it's legitimate. We know that not everybody's going to be saved. We know this. We know that wickedness exists, and it is tangible, and it produces hardship and sorrow and trials and violence and all of these things. Yes, it is. But we also know in the midst of that, God is doing miracles with sinners just like us. And he wants to reproduce this thing. Think about this. this. And this is really my last page, I promise. But think about your life for a second. You know, maybe some of you had some vices. When did you, when did you quit drinking? Was it before you were saved or after? When did you quit smoking? Some of you told me this. But was it before you were saved or was it after? When did you quit going to prison? Hopefully, it was uh, before you were saved or af hopefully after you quit, right? Was it before you were saved or after that you quit going to prison? Was it before you were saved or after that you quit sleeping around? Was it before you were saved or after when you quit fighting? When you quit cussing, was it before you were saved or after when you got an abortion? Was it before you were saved or was it after? See, God takes the stuff that we were and he forgives our sin, we got to start treating people like human beings. We've got to know that when we leave this place, what's on our lips? Hopefully, it's the good news of the gospel because we've seen it too many times to forget about what God has done. We cannot preserve an untouchable sin and not allow God to redeem it in the life of a person. We can't do it. We cannot vilify people because of their sin and tell God that he must judge them on their sin, even though he didn't judge me on mine. We have to see the real picture of the world that we live in. And the real picture, when you get out of all the fluff and the media and the hype and the noise, even though these things are happening, the real biggest picture is that most of the world 
is without God, and they are lost, and they don't even realize it. And here we are in the most beautiful time in history. We are the lights. The light has never been brighter than today. Look how many people. Brian and I said, evil has always been the same, but look how many people are on the earth. There's so much darkness out there in volume that your testimony stands out like never before. Let's use that to serve the Lord today, amen? Let's use our testimony to reach the real problem that humanity has. And you know what? We can still vote. We can still give money. We can still demonstrate. And we can still do whatever we want to do on social and moral issues. But we can't do it at the expense of failing the gospel. That's what my job is to you when you come to church, is to tell you what God says about people. You know that? And this is not an easy, easy thing to discuss this morning. I hope you realize that. It's nothing that I would take lightly. But this is the emergency that has been driving my life for quite some time. And I just want you to know it will continue to be. I won't be derailed from the gospel and from teaching and encouraging and motivating people to see what's happening in this world at the expense of focusing my efforts on something else. Doesn't mean that those aren't valid, but I won't trade it. Because your eternal soul is too valuable. And we have some seats here available for some more souls. And we're doing it, right? Many of you are telling me all these occasions you're having to share. I want to encourage you, don't get derailed. Keep sharing. Keep sharing the light of the gospel. You will change a life one at a time by sharing the gospel. Let's stand up and pray as we close.